Hi everybody, uh, today's Fridays with Feldman, and today's conversation will be about uh, upper extremity and arthrogryposis. And I'm going to do this without slides, and I would say that we change this a little bit because what we're doing now is we're announcing the topic about a week before and giving you a chance to write in questions about the topic even before I do the discussion. Certainly if any of you have any questions or you want videos or um, articles, you can certainly send me a um, send us an email and I'll send them out to you. So today's conversation about arthrogryposis and upper extremity is, is an interesting one because it used to be thought that not much could be done for the upper extremities in arthrogryposis. So I'm going to stick to AMC for a minute and then I'll get into some of the conversations as people ask me about arthrogryposis type 5 or distal arthrogryposis, which is a genetic form. But in terms of AMC, so one thing you have to understand, there's a variable amount of musculature in children. Not every child has the same muscles. Not every child has the same musculature that will actually work. One thing we know is that if the muscle is functioning, there's no question that doing physiotherapy and trying to strengthen that functioning muscle will make it much better. Not, if the muscle is not present at all, then really no physiotherapy for that muscle will work. So what are some of the most common problems? So let's start you know, at the wrist. The wrists are often flexed in arthrogryposis, and the only intervention with splinting and casting is really important. Flex means that it's downward, the wrists are, the palms are facing down. As the children get older, there are things you can do, and we look to see whether or not they really need anything done, because sometimes if you, if you looked at a fork, of a tine of a fork, it has a bend to it like my hand that I'm showing you. So it may not be so bad that their hand has a little bit of a bend, because then it can go to your mouth, and if it's fully straight, it may miss the mouth as the child begins to bend their elbows. So we do want to look at function, over cosmesis for upper extremity, but certainly cosmesis matters as well. One other thing we look at is whether or not we can gain, if there is a range of motion, can we gain refunction? Well, if they have some flexors, sometimes we transfer those muscles to the dorsum of the wrist, the top of the wrist, and make it into an extensor, which means that it helps lift the wrist up, and that's called an FCU to ECRB transfer. That Those terms don't matter, but basically what it means is you take a tendon, and you bring it from one location to another, and that helps it function in a different manner, in this case, to bring the wrist up. Another operation, uh, which is pretty common, is a carpal row osteotomy, which means that the wrist is down, and you can actually bring the wrist up by doing a little bit of a breakage of the bone that still maintains some motion and doesn't fuse the wrist into position. But again, we want to know what position it's functional in. So that's the first thing we do. Fingers mostly is just physiotherapy and arthrogryposis. Sometimes we widen the thumb area, or the hand surgeons will widen the thumb, uh, the, the thenar space, or the first web space, and that basically allows the thumb to function better. It gets it out of the palm. Sometimes we have to do some, we have to take care of some webbing. Um, in fact, a pretty simple operation where we get rid of the webbing of the fingers so that they can actually separate and the children have more function. Moving up the arm, we look at the elbow. Well, the elbow is often flexed or extended, meaning it's either stuck in extension, stuck straight, or sometimes it's stuck flexed. Well, stuck straight's a problem if both arms are stuck straight. But again, we're looking at, so we have to get it moving, and it's also usually rotated towards the chest, so it's internally rotated. So people ask, what do you do about that? Well, you can rotate it outward. And that's an osteotomy of the humerus, and you rotate it outward. You can take an elbow that's not flexing, and then you make it flex and you begin the range of motion. The key in my practice is never to cast those arms, ever. That we begin range of motion the day after surgery, and we have to achieve a full range of motion. Once we can get a range of motion which is functional, somewhere between 25 and 110 to 115, meaning that a, an elbow that goes just about 25 degrees to fully straight, bends up to about 115 degrees, those elbows, then we start looking at muscles that we can transfer. See, if, if there is no biceps, if there's no muscle that brings the arm to the mouth, the biceps, what can we use as a biceps? One of the questions asked to me was whether or not that you could do a muscle transfer from somebody else. Could it be a donor muscle? So we certainly have not done that. I don't believe that's been done in the world yet. Perhaps it has, not in the United States that I know for arthrogryposis. Um, and there are some issues with transferring donors, right? That means a patient has to take immunosuppressants or you know, drugs to not to prevent rejection. So it's not so simple a thing to take a muscle from somebody else. What about a muscle from somewhere else in the body of the same patient? We do that for, the plastic surgeons do that for big wounds. However, 
again, I've not seen that for orthogryposis where it's taken from one place to another, but that perhaps that's the future we should think about. But local muscles we do take. So one muscle someone asked me about is the pectoralis major, which is the one in the chest wall. So I am not a huge fan of that operation, especially in women because of the large scarring, but done correctly, it is a very good operation to have brought down to make it into a biceps. I like to use latissimus dorsi, which is a muscle on the side, which is not used very much except for pull down muscle when we used to climb trees and therefore it's not a very functional muscle in people. And it can be, people can live without that muscle. And if they had that muscle, how do we know they do? We get an MRI, then we can transfer that. And I've done that several times with really good results. Patients who are now able to, who could not even put their hand to their mouth, can now actively use their hands to their mouth, eat to the table by grab, taking something and actually bringing it to their mouth. But again, every child is different. Every child has to be evaluated. What muscle is present? What muscle is not present? The shoulder is more complicated. The shoulder, if you can't elevate it, that becomes a little bit more difficult to try to achieve elevation because you have to take it out muscle that is somewhere above that. Well, only really the trapezius muscle could be used for that. I personally have not used that muscle to try to raise the shoulder. because I think that, that you, if, as long as you have the range of motion, the, the patients and the children and adults can learn to compensate. I'm going to look at some of the questions, but again, so we look at the fingers, we do physiotherapy, we spread out the fingers, we sometimes get rid of webbing, we bring wrists from flexion into extension, uh, we bring elbows usually from, from extension, from straight into flexion, and we never cast them and we try to keep them moving all through it. So physiotherapy right after these surgeries is crucial. The nice part of the muscle transfers for gaining biceps, which works, is actually that it gets better over time. Over the time, I've noticed as the, as the children grow, it gets better. And, and probably the youngest age should be about four to five. And I don't think there is an old, older age where we can do it. We could probably still do it at any age if the muscle is present. And I try to strengthen the muscle that we're going to transfer prior to transfer it. Um, so for me, the most common operation that I do in arms of patients with arthrogryposis is rotating the humerus out. Because if your arm is stuck either behind you or it's stuck on your chest wall, you can't use it. Bringing the hands out in front doing what's called a humeral rotational osteotomy is the most common operation. Releasing elbows, muscle transfers, wrist surgeries, those are all pretty common operations in arthrogryposis. Now, someone asked me about type five or distal arthrogryposis. There are many different types of genetic forms of arthrogryposis. Arthrogryposis type five is one such type that's associated with ocular or eye problems or, or just a really pretty common uh, element. Children are absolutely intelligent. Um, and this is distal arthrogryposis with the hands and the wrists is much more complicated in treating it, but certainly doable. So I think, again, you, you use the same principles you used with the, um, the children who have AMC in, when you address distal arthrogryposis. I'm just asking, so, and then people want to know about early intervention is when do you, should you intervene in a child and start splinting and bracing? And I will answer that the sooner you begin, the better. The children who are aggressively treated by great physical therapists and occupational therapists from an early age, in my opinion, do the best. They achieve the range of motion. But again, sometimes it really is what muscles are present and what muscles aren't. So I, I advise you, that's really what you have to take into account. So whoever's treating your child really has to start listing the muscles that are available. So what can you take? What can't you take? I personally don't, triceps is not a good muscle to take for the biceps. That was the most common operation done. It's the back of the arm, you take it to the front, but then you lose the ability to straighten your arm actively, number one. And number two, it's never strong enough or rarely strong enough to be able to bring the hand to the mouth to eat well. So in summary, upper extremity, it's not a hopeless cause. I read in one article recently, it said that you cannot achieve biceps function in AMC by transferring a muscle. I think that's absolutely not true. And I can show you patient after patient who've had that done and can achieve really normalized eating at this point. So um, that's it for Upper Extremity today for the review. I want to wish you all a uh, very, very happy holiday. I'm going to answer some questions uh, before we leave. Uh, our next uh, Fridays with Feldman will be uh, in January 2020. Um, and I'll just take some questions and then I'll sign off for the weekend. First question, my husband and I are looking to adopt a three-year-old with arthrogryposis. He is affected in upper and lower extremities. 
He has had no interventions and we are curious how successful PT, OT, and surgical intervention is for kiddos who are older. A three-year-old. So someone asked about a three-year-old, what happens if your child, let's say, and this is not uncommon, is, you know, is being adopted from another country, usually from another country, who has arthrogryposis at three years of age, has been in an orphanage or somewhere like that, and has not been treated at all. I actually find those the kids the best kids to treat because they haven't had bad surgery. So absolutely, they can be treated. I even had an 11-year-old who was adopted from China with one of the most horrible or, or most difficult forms of AMC and Escobar, and he's walking independently now. So three-year-old is a great age to start. Um, you start with physiotherapy, and obviously I think you allow the child to adapt to the family first, and you start the therapy, and you don't rush to doing surgeries, and then you sort of map out a plan that doesn't remove the child from their life too often, so it doesn't become like a post-traumatic stress of bringing them into the hospital. And I try to do it very, very uh, grouped together, so the child goes through one rehabilitation, one period of time to do all this. Um, but I don't, but there's certainly a three-year-old or even a 10-year-old it's certainly not too late to begin the process and you start with physio, stretching, you see what muscles they have and there's no question that we can achieve uh, at least as much as that child could possibly achieve. So again, signing off for 2020, wishing you, you and your families a, a wonderful holiday season that's coming up and uh, hopefully one that uh, brings uh, uh, our country and our world peace and uh, prosperity. I have a uh, happy and healthy holiday season. Signing off for Fridays with Feldman in 2019. Thanks for listening.